All yeah. right. All right. Peace, people. We're here with Reza Rizvi, and uh, this is going to be an interview. From what I'm told, uh, you used to be a quote unquote car carrying Shia, but now you've been having, I don't want to say second thoughts, but been doing a little <laughs> reflecting on some of the <laughs> positions you used to hold. So uh, yeah, if you wanna if you wanna have a few words or say anything. Uh, yeah, but first of all, just uh, I wanna say thank you, man. Thank you, Tyrone, for having me on, man. Uh, oh, yeah, no salam problem. to you, salam to Zaryab. Um, yeah, man, it's been a little while, bro. It's just been a little while. I've just been out of the loop. Um, just happy to come and say salam again and see what's been going on. Uh, you know, obviously, naturally with the whole COVID thing, listen, I think everyone's just been at home. Everyone's had a lot of time to reflect. Like, I think everyone's just been isolated. So it's forced everyone to, I think, kind of study and whatever you're on, just everyone's just been reflecting. So naturally, in that same period, it's, I've, I've had, alhamdulillah, the same opportunity. So, um, yeah, Zariah always been telling me, like, let's let's do a little talk. So I was like, yeah, man, why not, man? Zariah's always been a good brother, man, always about um, difference of opinion, always about respecting. So I was like, you know what, if there's someone I'd rather speak to about this, it would be someone like Zariah, man, where we can discuss topics and stuff. It's essentially, the, one of the original I points mean, that we wanted to discuss was a start for Haram Maliki. Zariah, go on, I'll let you take yeah. it away. Yeah, exactly. It's a good introduction. I think we can start it off by touching upon something I was just saying before we came with before we uh, jumped on the live. And it's that my channel is, is, is showcasing um, critical views within different perspectives uh, of Islam. So what I mean by that is to, to make it simpler. Is I want to showcase people who are critical of their own tradition. So whether that's Sunniism, mm. or whether that's Shiism, or whether that's Sardism, I, I want to um, be able to kind of show the world how there are critical takes within all these different uh, positions. And it's not all about polemics where you're pointing outside. There's a lot of people that are working to clean their own house, so to speak. And so I think that is a good intro or kind of, yeah, it's a good overview of what we're hoping to kind of explore in, these, in this interview. And um, so with that, we, we have someone uh, who's currently languishing in jail in Saudi Arabia. Um, by the name of Ustad uh, Hassan Farhan al-Maliki. I'm sure many, many people would have heard of his name as he's concerned with, with, with cleaning up house or being critical of his tradition. And his tradition is a Sunni tradition, specifically a Hanbali mm. tradition as he was raised and taught in, the, in, the Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. He learned at the, at the, at the, uh, officially, like at a university, but he also learned at the hands of scholars like he even learned with Ibn Baz, uh, there's, there's numerous interviews where he discusses his time where he studied with uh, Ibn Baz. Um, and and wow. for his positions and for his uh, take and his critical view on, uh, on, 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 on Sunni, Hanbali Islam and, 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 and um, the output, the guy is a scholar of, 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 of you know, he's of certain magnitude. He's got a lot of writings out there. Unfortunately, not many of his writings and publications have been translated yet. But a lot of his videos have been translated. Um, mm. So you can get a gist of what he's saying and what his views are from his videos. And I understand, Raza, that you've recently been listening to a lot of um, a lot of his videos or a lot of his kind of takes and a lot of his positions. So to start off by telling us what your reception is of the first person for having that or, yeah, yeah Zariah, man, Allah, man. you dropped it. You done me a nice thing there with Ustad for Han Maliki, man. He's um al half of the lot. Allah protect him, preserve him. He's um been a big influence on me, man. Like um, you know what? Even when I was in my hardcore like Shia days, I would always still listen to him, and I was always this guy. I used to be like, bro, this guy is different, man. This guy is uh, like he would just break things down in different ways, and I think. One of the main things also you have to remember is, as a Shia as well, is that when someone from the majority tradition, uh, that quote on be the broader Sunni tradition, is actually fair on certain issues and actually accepts certain things that are obvious. You know, there's certain times where something's obvious and then due to polemics or, some, or, or due to sectarian bias, bias, someone's like, no, I don't accept this. Is a, this is a Shia lie. And it's like, bro, like you kind of like start questioning yourself, thinking, bro, like this is so obvious. How is someone denying this? And then, you get someone as objective like Ustad Farhan Malik, he's like, no, this is a this is a reality, you know. 
when she is say certain things, it's a reality. And someone like Ustad Farhan Malik, he's able to balance that and stay, still, still maintain his own tradition, but at the same time, accept some truths that the Shia sect brings. And when he used to do that, I used to be like, wow, this guy's objective. And actually, when someone does that, you want to listen to everything else they've got to say because you're like, this person's fair, right? So he was obviously always on a Quran-centric vibe. And I think, what, Zariab, you're one of the early ones as well that told me about, you know, trying to refer back to the Quran more and, you know, a couple of the other brothers as well, you know, Junaid, et cetera, et cetera. So I used to be like, all right, cool. And then just started watching more of his um, lectures and more of his videos. And I used to be like, this guy's fair, man. And one, one of the beautiful things that he really, that made me um, understand things in a different light was that he used to be like, listen, I think you know we're discussing it before I jumped on, where he was basically like, listen, both he's got like lectures where he advises both Shias and Sunnis. And he would say stuff like, listen, from, for the Sunnis, this is my advice to the Sunnis and this is what my advice to Shias. And he's got obviously different, different devices because we're different kind of mindsets and um, m- um, methodologies. But his, his essence would be that, listen, critique your own school and be critical of your own thought. Don't worry about the other person's thought. And when you're critical enough on your own thought, Naturally, it's like I start off at A, Zariab, you as a, you know, I, mean, I know you don't really call yourself Sunni like that, but you know my point, right? You, let's just use your example as, as some, you know, hardcore Sunni and I'm a hardcore sh- Shia at A, you're a hardcore Sunni at C. When you'll be yeah. able to, crit- when you're able to be critical of your own tradition and I'm, I'm able to be critical of my own tradition, naturally, we're going to meet up at B somewhere, aren't we? Like, we're going to kind of, not necessarily that we have to agree on everything, but it's going to be like coming closer to each other. And, and that's, I think, real takrib. You know when they say about trying to have unity? And that's real takrib because your both sects are able to criticize each other. So it sounds a lot better when you're able to criticize your own tradition and you don't get into defensive mode as well. And Raza, um, I think I might. I, I think I would agree with you on uh, if two people of different sects or schools of thought criticize their own school of thought or sect, um, eventually they'll come closer to each other. I found that mm. with, within myself. Uh, coming from, uh, I mean, I'm a convert, but then mm-hmm. converting to uh, Sunni Islam, um, mm-hmm. when I started critiquing or looking into uh, the Sunni perspective on history, um, mm-hmm. or actually looking at the early Islamic history from like a uh, uh, Western academic lens, uh, and then mm-hmm. also looking at it from a Shia lens, mm-hmm. I started to see holes in the Sunni narrative about how... Uh, the Sahaba were all hunky dory and and things mm. like that. And even though I didn't all the way uh, agree with the Shia perspective, mm. with um, which um, excuse me if I'm incorrect about this, that uh, all the Sahaba basically kind of apostated or became fossils except for like four. Um, mm. I don't know if that's the truth or not, but that's the the impression I got. But when I read, yeah, yeah. but when I read their history. You know, just seeing how uh, of what I heard about Ali, um, that he uh, wasn't too happy with what was going on uh, after the prophet's death concerning mm-hmm. succession. He didn't play a mm-hmm. huge role in a lot of what was going on politically in the caliphate mm-hmm. of uh, Abu Bakr and Omar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also looking at the uh, what I know from the Sunni narratives, how, yeah, after the prophet's death, Ali kind of did take a, uh, it, you, he, you would seem, it does seem like he took a back seat. You know, just kind of got my, I'm not going to rant on about it, but kind of got my, uh, the gears working in my head. Like, you know, maybe there's more to this than a single narrative that you find mm-hmm. in the majority uh, sect or Sunni Islam. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Like, that, this is this is precisely it. And- once you, I'm, I'm just just the point that you made about the three. There's no doubt within the history of of uh, twelve Shiism, there would have been a couple of extremists that held the opinion that you mentioned, but that by far is not like the mainstream position any anyhow today. That's definitely one of our extremer positions, but it's definitely a position that it's clearly bottle and uh, clearly kind of makes you want to run a mile, right? <laughs> you know, all the Sahaba apostate apart from three, clear. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it, it is forwarded in the uh, Sunni circles a lot about us. And she has had to do a better job at conveying it. But, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's, uh, it's become like a, a super kind of minority position. Only extremists hold it now. Yeah. 
And I'm starting to notice that Sufis are a little, uh, it seems like they have uh, Shi'i leanings. Uh, um, They're pro Alid. Sufis always tend to yeah. have the pro Alid kind of tendency. You see, the, the pro Alid tendencies in Sunnism, they ended up like they were obviously in early Sunnism, it wasn't only the Sufis, but later on in our, in our time, a lot of the pro Alid tendencies have shifted only amongst the Sufi circles. Mm -hmm. um, and they were naturally because of their spiritual chains that they link back to the prophet a lot of them go via imam ali so that's why they always have that special reverence for imam ali and that got me thinking about another thing and i don't want to go too far off topic is yeah. you know er, uh, early uh islamic scholars classical scholars you know I'm, I'm starting to wonder and this was mentioned by another brother so i didn't come up with it you know in our early history has have sunni muslims grafted into their history classical scholars that might not have exactly been Sunni. Because um, when I look into some uh, classical scholars, let's say Al-Tabari mm. or whatnot, you know, uh, he's classified as Sunni on Wikipedia, but when you look into his history, uh, it would lead me to think otherwise. <laughs> yeah, as, but, in, as in, you know, it's, it, it's what you call proto-Sunnism. At that time, as in, we, we, we've narrowed the gap, isn't it? At, at, at the time of Tabari, what, what it meant to be Sunni is very different. Um, what it means today to be Sunni, like we've, uh, you know, a, a lot of Tabri's views, he, clearly he was a pro Ali type of guy, right? Yeah. He was blatantly a pro Ali type of guy. And, and, and he also rejected the Humbly school. He didn't see it as a <laughs> yeah. legitimate, he didn't see Ahmed ibn Humble as a jurist. <laughs> it was formulating at that time, so there was no orthodoxy. Everyone kind of was like, you know, I don't have, to. you know, it was only now that someone says, what, you don't believe in Ahmed Humble? You're not Sunni. Back in the day, it was like, no, I don't have to believe in Ahmed Humble because it wasn't formulated, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah. So uh, dogmas come later, isn't it? Dogmas and formulation come later. And uh, going back to the original line of thought, you are 100% correct. And when you're, we're both able to critique our tradition, that's the real type of unity where you can actually respect each other and you're actually critical rather than me saying, oh, by the way, let me let me be critical of Sunnism. And then when it comes to Shiism, close my mind. And you saying, let me be critical. Very, It's like you have a different standard for the opponent. When you're on the opponent, you're looking at literally every gap and you're like no but here's inconsistency this don't make sense and and then when it comes to your own tradition it's like <laughs> the, the rules are so relaxed <laughs> yeah not the same standard that you hold uh that you, hold, and, and, and you know what that's subconsciously you end up doing that so it's very important um uh, so you have to really it's, 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 it's like a jihad on nafs you have to fight yourself and make sure that your bias doesn't let you do that you know what i'm saying you've got to fight yourself because it's going to happen when we're humans we align with groups, you know. If you're my boys, or you're up to my boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a soft spot towards you, towards you lot, right? So if someone says something, I'm gonna be like, no, I did my. So it's gonna happen naturally. So you gotta fight it and say, no, wrong is wrong, right is right. You get it? Yeah. So um, yeah. So you know, start for Han Maliki, half of the law. You know, his Quran centric approach, the way he deals with things in a respectful manner, uh, the way he would advise both communities. So he was a real big um, influence on me for me to start, you know, realizing actually, let me start to get a bit more Quran centric. And right. I think, you know, Quran centric this, this, this is This now right. leads to the, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Now, I wanted that it, it leads to perfectly to the next question that I had. Go on. Was the, what, what then, uh, what effect did that then have on you in terms of the way you approach the in the sense that given, okay, you said that, you said that you engaged with a lot of Hassan, uh, sort of Hassan Farhan and Malik's work and it kind of prodded you to become more Quran Orientated or Quran centric, and mm, to kind mm. of use that as the mayar or the, as the standard mm. you know, for your for your belief. So, what what kind of effect did that have in reality? Give me some examples of how that materially affected some things that you used to may have hold um, that you don't no longer now hold, for example, or some yes, things so, that you may have problematized. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, before it would have been like you know, Al Quran. You know, it was like it was like Kitab Allah. Everyone had it was it was you know it's Alhamdulillah always going to be Muqaddis, but it was like this Muqaddis book that, you know, it's like a, co it's it almost like a coded book where you need Azbab al-Nazul, you need Ulama, you need Tafsir. It was like a very kind of coded type of thing where it's like, like, Raza, if you read it, you won't even understand it. This is very deep stuff. And with the, with the when I used to watch the stuff from Hamaliki, there's no Ulama, there's no Tafsir. He's quoting the ayah and just breaking down the Arabic. And I'm thinking like, what? Like, there's no Tafsir, there's no this, there's no that. What's going on here? Like, wait, Everything he's saying is making sense. I'm like, but this just seems simple. And then I'm like, what? Like, is, is this how it's supposed to be? And then I'm like, oh, no, no, hold on. 
How about tafsir of Al Bayt? You need tafsir and all of that. And it's like some the, the verses that he's breaking down. I'm like, actually, what tafsir is this to the verse? Like, what what, what tafsir am I going to get that's going to that's going to make me understand this verse differently? And then I started understanding that a lot of people are saying we need tafsir. In the end, you say in Surah Fatiha, and you end up proving Yali Madid from it, meaning Imam Ali helped me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> meaning, so, so the tafsir becomes a clear contradiction to the ayah. And it's like, hold on. These tafsirs that I'm reading are not necessarily the tafsirs that I attribute to Adal Bayt. I'm just saying, generally, when scholars are doing tafsir of the verse, you're like, hold on. Like, we, we're just drifting from the Quran. We're just drifting. This is not, you know, Allah spoke clearly in the Quran. You start realizing that actually, the biggest trick that scholars have played from all sides is to basically say that you don't read the Quran directly. That was one of the biggest tricks that they played. That, oh, don't read the Quran directly because, you know, you know, you don't, you know, you don't know this asul and you don't know this kaida and you don't know this and you ain't studied for 20 years and you need... And it actually, when you start studying, it's like, you know, the Quran's quite a clear kitab. Allah spoke clearly in the Quran. This is the last testament for humanity. And a good example would be Zaryab. Something like, you know, I, I, as, as a quick one, I'll bring up istighatha, you know, asking yeah. Ghair Allah for help. You know, that's a big part of today's 12 culture. That's a massive part of today's 12 culture. Um, the Quran is like, the, 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 it doesn't go with the Quranic theme. As in the Quran clearly encourages you to ask Allah alone. So I was like, hold on, like, and obviously in my head, it used to be like, okay, well, you know, fine. I know that I, I, I always knew that subconsciously, but I used to be like, yeah, but the narrations say it, right? And I was like, but hold on. We have a principle in our school that says, if you have any narration, compare it with the Quran. Then I started looking at that narration, understanding what this is actually mean. And I started coming to the conclusion that what this actually means, it doesn't mean that, well, if the Quran hasn't said explicitly, it's not allowed, you can do it. No, but rather what it means is, is it, is it agreeing with the theme of the Quran? And once you start understanding the Quran or you're like that, it's like the theme of the Quran is clearly in your time of need, in your time of, the, the, you know, in your time of need, in your, in your time of mushkil, you ask Allah. And this is the way of the Anbiya, and this is the way of the Salihin, and this is the way of the al Bayt, and this is the way of the Sahab. And you're like, hold on. So this narrative that, you know, it, now even if you bring me a hadith that says the opposite, I'm going to say, hold on. Even if you show me it, say Sunday, I'm going to say, hold on. This is not agreeing with the Quranic narrative. So you start basically realizing that actually the Quran's sufficient, bro. As in the Quran is sufficient for you to understand basic points that Allah wants you to understand. So it's the Gatha basically went out the window for me because I was like, hold on. Like, and then you're going to your scholars. You're saying, okay, okay, let's see what the scholars are saying. Scholars are going left, right. Man's bringing up this proof, that proof, this proof, you know, bringing something from here, bringing something from here. And I was in the game and I, like, I was in the polemics point. So I kind of knew all the proofs. But I used to be like, hold on, what are we doing? Are we subconsciously proving something that is clearly not there. <laughs> Do you get my point? So, yeah, yeah. Well, so let me let me engage with that. So would you say you, you were guilty of confirmation bias when it came to when it came to kind of proving quote unquote things like Istiqada? Because you mentioned a few points there and, and uh, it's worthwhile rehashing them to kind of uh, make yes. the point. So when you talk about the acrobatics that are used by the scholars and um, the acrobatics used to kind of make a verse or make a hadith or I mean hadith are easier because they they are pretty much saying that you can call upon other than Allah or, or you know see there's someone yeah, yeah. through you know yeah. they, they, they exactly but so back to the Quran so you're saying that the acrobatics used to make a verse fit like you said about in in uh al-Fatiha in the opening chapter you alone we worship and you alone we yeah. help you ask up yeah yeah um, you're saying that that is then made to fit this pre-existing belief that you can ask for others. Yeah, than. yeah, and and you know what it was Yob? I alhamdulillah, I always tried to be objective. Like I, 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 I like certain man. I'm sure everyone would say this, but I actually tr like generally, I would actually try and be like, let me follow the proofs. But you see, the problem is in this kind of situation when you're in and you're in a sect, you don't even realize it. That subconsciously, you think you're doing that. But you're actually not. So my intention was never, oh, I'm going to prove something even though I know it's about it. But stuff for law, bro. The intention is always like, bro, I'm going to, you know, try and go with the proofs. Now, subconsciously, you end up <laughs> proving something or trying to prove something which clearly is anti-Quranic. Now, it's all about methodology, right? 
as in back back in the day, that methodology was like, yeah, well, the Quran Allah doesn't say you can't, right? So you know, therefore, it's fine. And it's like, well, actually, I don't think that's what it meant when the imams explained that you compare every report that comes from us with the Quran. The imams meant, which is what is the Quranic theme? Is what you call hakimiyah al Quran. What is the the Quran is the hakim. What does it, what is the Quran directing you to do? And you clearly get a gist of it, as in, um, and you start realizing. Uh, I'll tell you another point interesting um, that I really benefited from. I'm not sure if you lot know about this person, but there's um, and he was he's a massive influence in me, and and everyone that knows me knows that anyway. Um, the massive influence on me was someone called engineer Muhammad Ali Mirza. So he's from the he's from the Indo Pak. So he's from Pakistan. You lot heard of him? Any of you lot? I'm, I doubt you lot would have, but any just yeah. in case. Uh, can you say that yeah, name one more time? For... Engineer Muhammad Ali Mirza. So there you are. You probably know him because of my statuses. <laughs> I, I haven't. I know I haven't. Yeah, Teron, I didn't think he would. He normally speaks in Urdu and Punjabi. So okay. he's from Pakistan, Teron. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit about him. He's from a Sunni background, and he's actually an engineer by profession. And um, what's interesting about him is this, that he obviously grew up in like a Brel, like a Brelvi household. And he then obviously spent X amount of might, years in might, Brelvi. Just one sec, one sec, Rosie. might just want to explain what Brelvi is. Oh, Brelvi, oh yeah, yeah, for the, because I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not talking to the Indo-Pak guys. <laughs> no, I know, <laughs> the, I know, the, I know the difference. I, I did some work with my brother-in-law and he uh, works in the Pakistani community within the two <laughs> yeah, different yeah. communities. <laughs> and I, I've heard. Yeah, so you know, so you know. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard what the other had to say about the other. So I'll say, I'll say it just, for the, I'll say, I'll say it for the viewers' sake. Brelvi is, yeah, no problem. Uh, as as a sect, is just basically uh, Sunnism with a strong Sufi sentiment. Um, you know, following the kind of traditional Sunnism, but with a hardcore Sufi influence, and following one scholar in specific, in, in specific called Ahmed Raza Khan Al Breli, and he that was an area in India that he was from, and he held from. And that sect then became associated with his positions and it became very taqlidi in his positions. They literally follow no matter what he, whatever he says. Um, um, would you say that the, the Barazis are the second or perhaps one of the two biggest groups in the Indo-Pak region? No, no, they're the, the, the biggest. One. Indo-Pak, they're the biggest. There's, there's another no doubt one. Okay, is, so, they're, uh, so they're the, the, the biggest. biggest. And the, yeah, yeah, they're, and they're the, the biggest. Like, the, like, yeah. In the UK... In UK, Salafis quite like Salafis are loud. In Indo Pak, bro, Brelvis are the strong ones. <laughs> mm. That's really you interesting. Anyway, you don't, you don't play with them. You, you don't play you, you, like you don't like Salafis can't say what they say here over there, bro. You can't play with them lot over there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, so you were saying uh, with with um, yeah. So engineer Muhammad Ali. Uh, so he's, you're going to really find this person's story interesting. Engineer Muhammad Ali Mirza, half of the law. Um. Allah preserve him. So what he would do is, is that he was like from a Brelvi background and then he then left Brelviism for whatever reasons and actually then became Diobandi for a bit. Diobandi is the more, uh, it's like a between hardcore Sufism, and, like Brelviism and Salafism. It's like in between them two. Uh, I'm just saying it as a broad way. After Diobandiism, he actually then spent some time yeah. with the Al-Hadith movement, which Al-Hadith in Indo-Pak is basically the name for Salafi. And then after that, he actually some spent some time with the Shia as well. So what this person obviously he's still he's still a Sunni, but he was actually listening to everyone. So what so what he ended up doing was he ended up basically sitting down and said that basically, I am going to make a YouTube channel, and I am going to start dealing with all contest contest contested issues of Islam. I have seen all the sects, and I've seen how all the sect scholars all are sectarian. They all have different motives. They all are about protecting their sects. None of them are actually about the Quran and the Sunnah. They literally have their own agendas, each sect. And I'm going to basically say fact. whatever I feel. Go, sorry, sorry, Zero. Go on. I'm saying, which is a fact. He's talking yeah, about it. Was amazing. Context, yeah, it was amazing. And, we can see and it. So, we can see yeah, it. Yeah, we can see world. it 100%. So when I used yeah. to see it, when, when, when he used to say that, I used to be like, yeah, all right, cool. You know, he's just. Just probably like a you know probably like a Sunni that's you know a bit bit reformist type this and that so I'm listening to him now and then you know it's it, and he started he was a very like he's he probably influenced me one of the most because at one time he'll be saying only ask Allah for help which generally as you know it is like nowadays the Salafi thing to say true generally that's kind of their forte right like only ask Definitely. Allah yeah 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 you know asking Allah shirk cool. And then in the same sentence, he'll be saying, 
and Imam Ali was Imam Ali was on truth in all his battles, and we support Imam Ali. And anyone who came against Ali is upon Batil. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What? So normally he. You find the Shias saying that and you find the Salafis saying that. When's the last time you had two in one? Never. You don't. So you're thinking, okay, cool. All right. Let, or I'm thinking, all right. I started listening to him and I was like, he says, you're saying your Ali mother is shirk. But then he's saying Imam Ali is the truth. Uh, he was oppressed. He completely, in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, the way engineer has opened up Muawiyah and the character of Muawiyah in terms of what Muawiyah did in history in terms of his hate against Imam Ali and the institutionalization of cursing of Imam Ali yeah, and the book of Imam Ali. Every Friday. There, there, there has been no one, I assure you, in the Indo-Pak in the indo um, uh, community and in the, in the countries, there has been no one that's opened up Muawiyah the way he has, not even a Shia. A Shia has never done the work that engineer has. He's literally, what he does is he would quote the reference, he would get the scan, he would quote the volume, the page, the scan would come on the page and in a very academic and remember he's still Sunni, so he would he wouldn't even hold the position that Muawiya is like because like some pro ally Sunnis hold the position that Muawiya is condemned and they don't even praise him or they don't or they don't even respect him. Engineer doesn't hold that position. Engineer would still say Hadrat, which in Urdu, Urdu and Farsi means uh, on a on a of respect. He would still say Hadrat. He would still say Radila Anhu. So I used to be like, this guy's confusing, bro. He's still holding on to that old protocol. But at the same time, he is literally. He is not mincing words. He is being real with what Muawiya did. He is not hiding it at all. So then he would basically talk in his lectures and basically, he would basically say that the scholars, scholars are playing you. He would keep drilling it in his head, in, in, in his videos, that the scholars are playing you. And I used to be like, what? And he would be like, the Diobandi scholars are playing you here. The Salafi scholars are playing you here. The Shia scholars are playing you here. The Burelbi scholars are playing you here. And he literally wouldn't care about scholars, bro. He would be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. Let's talk about what the Quran says. Let's talk about what the Hadith says. Don't talk, talk to me about scholars. You know, kind of like what... And it got so bad with him that that kalam of, you know, we go by the Quran and Sunnah, that, that kalam generally you hear from the Salafis, right? Like, they're the ones who champion that. Like, we don't really care about scholars. Yeah, we yeah. care about Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. It got so bad, Zariyab, that he started opening up Muawiyah so bad and started talking about contentious issues within the Sunni school, you know, that... The Salafis started saying, no, no, let's go to the scholars. Like, we shouldn't go listen to the, we shouldn't be going directly to the text. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> like, he beat, them at the, he beat them at their own game. And I used to be like, all right, you know, you know, a couple of weeks I used to be like, all right, he's good. But I used to be like, yeah, but you know, he's good. But yeah, man, but this Yali mother thing. <laughs> I used to be like, yeah, but this Yali mother thing though, man. But then he's given proofs and I'm thinking, bro, they're Quranic proofs, man. He's the, the Sunnah is clear, the Quranic proofs are clear. And then I started looking into the Shia text. The Shia text seemed to be clear on the issue. So I'm thinking, yeah, like, what's going on here? And then I'm thinking, okay, but my, like, the scholars don't, like, all these scholars that we have, the Shia scholars of today, they're not, they're not saying that. Then I started thinking, but this is what he's trying to tell me, that the scholars will never tell you the truth. And then I, always, like, I was always textual in my approach. Like, I'll give you a good example from years ago. Probably like five, ten years ago, a long time ago, since I was young. As you lot will know, that in the Shia call to prayer in the Adhan, in the Shia Adhan, there's a there's a line that's mentioned, which is uh, they say Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah. I'm sure you lot know that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, since I was since a young age, I studied that topic. Like, remember the polemics I got into later. But since a young age, I've always been interested in studying, and I was very. Like I used to study Sunni books, Shia books. I was always been a study, like someone who had the interest in Islam. Polemics just came later. That wasn't, that's just a part of my life. Meaning I was, before started getting into polemics, I was studying, I was studying Al-Qadis, Al-Shifa. I was studying Muhadir Al-Shab, Al-Muhadir Huck's books. I was studying, I was studying, you know, all types of books of Sunni theology and stuff like that. I, I would understand it. So I used to be like, hold on, like this Ashaduna al why, why, this is, I, I studied and I was like, we added this. I checked the references. I checked the, the narrations from our own Shia sources. The imams never recited it. And in fact, our early scholars condemned it. And they called it a bidah. And I was like, what? But then, you know, I was like, you know what? Yeah, then, then the later scholars came and they started justifying it. And literally, I'm talking about justifications where, you know, yeah, well, we're not saying it's part of the Adhan, so therefore it's fine. It's only bad if you say it's part of the Adhan. You know, that kind of... You know, no offense to Jewish people, but like, you know, that rabbi, Talmud, that, that kind of business, when you're trying to play games with the law. 
Or, or is it a case of um, using it as an identity marker later yeah, on? I can imagine yeah, how 100, 100, when, when yeah, go as on, it crystallizes, and, uh, as she is and crystallizes, and after it's been crystallized, then it becomes uh, almost hunted, and uh, one of the groups that are persecuted. You can imagine how that line would be taken as an identity marker, and it's no longer. It's, but you can think back. Their consideration, I mean, the scholars, it wouldn't have been to follow the Quran and Sunnah. At that point, their interest and their motivation. Yeah, so, was, so, uh, so, 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 at that moment in time, group. yeah. So, at that moment in time, when you're promoting your sect, and it's about identity, not about what the imams. Because remember, the claim of our claim is to follow the Al Bayt, right? If the Al Bayt are not reciting the Adhan, and our earlier scholars are calling it a bid'ah, and then by the time of the Safi scholars, you reversed it and now added it to the Adhan, that's a problem, my brother, because you've just went from bid'ah. To try to now go, so I went from bid'ah to yeah, well, it's haram. Yeah, okay, you should have. Okay, then it's gone to yeah, okay, don't say it's part of the adhan. You can allow it. So it's become mubah. Then it's gone to actually it's mustahab because actually you know you should say Ali's name. We're not saying it's part of the adhan. And then now some scholars are saying it's wajib. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm thinking, bro, it's, hold it's, on, it's, hold on. So that yeah. was like ten years it's really ago. Interesting. Bro. It's, it's... As an example, it's really interesting because yeah, that's and, what you just explained is the process yeah. as Shiism goes along the line. And then at the end, in the Safavid period, when they're opposed to the Ottoman Empire and they're trying to, you know, have this identity of a state based on Shia Islam, you can see how now it's at the end of that process you spoke of where it becomes, you know, uh, something that's uh, beneficial or something that's mustahab, as you put it. Exactly. So I'm thinking, hold on. So I'm thinking it's gone from that. Look at the evolution. I'm thinking that's and so when I used to, when I was like 10 years ago, there was a scholar, alhamdulillah, he's still alive. His name is Sheikh a Sheikh and he's an Ayatollah as well. Uh, by the way, for the non Ayatollah just means is he's someone's a mujtahid, meaning he's able to extract, like der derive his own law when it comes to like Fatawa and stuff. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, there was a scholar called uh, there is a scholar called Sheikh Muhammad Hussain Najafi. Uh they call him in Pakistan Adaku, which is his actual like tribe, tribe, half of the law. And he was very textual, bro. And in Indo in India, in India, Pakistan, bro, they're very like extreme in their Shiism in the, in the sense of their practices. They have like a lot of practices that are clearly are not supported in text. And they literally just do what they want. And Shah the Thalas are like, we call it the third testimony. This is something that if you don't recite in Shia circles, everyone will look at you and be like, what? Like, what? You don't recite? Like it's become it's become that norm. Like people, Shia, the, the layman Shia don't even know it's not part of the Adhan. You know that, right? The layman Shia won't even know that. The layman Shia will be like, and then if they're a bit clued on, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, but we're not saying it's part of the Adhan. It's only Mustahab. It's like, hold on, my brother. How did it become Mustahab? How did, how did, how did it become Mustahab? But anyway, Sheikh Mohafiz al Najafi actually called it like a bidah in Pakistan. And 10 years ago, like everyone like went nuts on him. And I used to be like, but he's right though. And everyone used to be like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We know that Imam's never said it, but why is he saying it's a bidah? I'm like, well, it is. <laughs> we added it, right? And then scholars would come with, yeah, yeah, but that's not the definition of bid'ah. So then what my, my, my tuning, my brain tuning went to actually, maybe I've got the definition of bid'ah wrong. That that's not the, the, the you know, the definition of bid'ah. As long as you don't believe it's part of the Adhan, it's not a bid'ah. So then my mind, they started, they, they messed up my mind like that. So then if you look at it like that, nothing's a bid'ah because actually, and that's obviously what I'm saying now. For the last, you know, two, three years, that wasn't my... I, I justified a lot of things because I used to be like, yeah, but... So when Salafis used to say, this is something's a bid'ah, I would be like, no, let's talk about the definition of bid'ah because that's not my definition of bid'ah. Defini and you know, the broader Sunni schools have the same problem. The broader Sunni schools... Only Salafis are kind of hardcore with definition of bid'ah. The broader Sunni schools are a bit more light and lenient as well. So a lot of things become acceptable. So I used to be like, but, you know, that's not my definition of bid'ah, bro. So therefore, it's not a bid'ah for me. And that wasn't me playing a game. That was just, well, that's what my scholars have taught me, right? That's not. And then they would, they would say, look, otherwise, this is a bid'ah. This is a bid'ah. Clearly, you know, Salafis have gone extreme in this. Give, you, can, you can give an example. You can just to finish or uh, uh, kind of add to that point. You can give an example of the Umayyad uh, changing uh, the order of the khutbah in the Eid. Yeah. Eid, yeah. For example. So. That is something that is um, an example of like early proto Sunni kind of not seeing a problem with an intro a bid'ah and religious innovation, right? And oh, although you, it could, you, can, you could also argue that the hadith indicates some companions did see it as problematic. You know what I mean? 
and that's 100%. why they kind of called it out. So, 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 Zariah, when you when your whole definition of bid'ah is warped, and your whole definition of shirk is warped, and you've got a different understanding or different, you've been told a different understanding, you know, then basically these things aren't as popular. So it's like, yeah, no, I know, I know the imams didn't recite it, bro, but you know what it is, bro. It's not a bid'ah because we're not saying it's part of the adhan. And technically, you're allowed to like technically speak during adhan. So therefore, you know, it just counts as me speaking. So it's a lot of technicalities in a soul. And you're thinking, and, 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 you, and you send me just to fight it to yourself. You're like, yeah, well, fair enough. Like they've got like a loophole there. And it's like, well, the scholars are saying it and, you know, all right, cool. Like, but then, then you start reflecting and you start thinking, hold on, like based on your definitions of bid'ah and shirk, nothing's a bid'ah and shirk. <laughs> yeah, and this, 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 nicely, this nicely brings me to the to the next. I've got two questions for you to, and you can take it whichever direction you want to take it. One point was the different approaches. Ultimately, what's at the core is different approaches, methodologies, whether it's an usuli approach or whether it's an akhbari or more literalist, mm. textualist uh, approach, uh, or whether it's a kind of. Um, as I say, so you've got a question of approaches. How does one approach? Uh, the religious texts and religious sources. But then also you've got the question of like, uh, the, the other question that comes to mind. If if you're talking about Siddha, you have to talk about Shirk, and you just mentioned it there. So touch upon Shirk as well and some examples of uh, of, of of that that you've kind of come across and wrestled. Yeah, with. so... Whichever, whichever way you want to... Whichever way I want to do it. So yeah, with, yeah. with Shirk, it would be basically be like, the way that a lot of the modern scholars today have made it, bro, nothing actually fits in the criteria of shirk. And shirk would be basically, if you read books like Sheikh Jafar Subhani's got a book, you can check it out on Islam. It's called Wahhabism. And if you read the book, when he talks about stuff like Istaghafa and stuff like asking Gera Allah for help and stuff. So the, the natural discussion, and it's obviously more can, of a... Can I, can I, if you don't mind if I interject for a second. Um, Go for it. Because I wanted to bring this up earlier, but the conversation went in another, not in another direction, but elsewhere. Uh, and that, since we're back on the topic of is, uh, my Arabic's horrible. My no, wife my, my me all the time. Mom is probably worse than yours, G. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see in a minute. All right. So <laughs> istiaga, 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 it's the it's the Okay. I, I know yeah. inter intercession, basically, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm surprised that um, none of the Shia would uh, used uh, um, a, a verse that Sufis used to use on me. I believe it's in chapter four. I can't remember. The, <laughs> I know uh, what it verse. is. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you. 464, 464. Okay, something, I'm a paraphrase, like if you knew better, you would have came to the prophet. Come to the prophet and also and... she has used that. She has, she has a lot to use that. Okay. 100%. All right. Because um, that's what I used to hear all the time. And that was like, and, and to be honest, it seems like on a matter concerning intercession which is a part of dean religion it would be uh, the the quran would be clear on something like that and uh, this is and and, and Teron, this is where it comes down to like what is your like when your epistemology about the quran becomes clear that actually allah would make these things clear like he's not going to leave you in in uh, that's the whole miracle of the quran by the way that ayah if you just, if you study the siyak of the ayah uh, in terms of actually again quran centric study the ayah that's actually about Munafikin going to the Prophet to make him. Uh, <laughs> it's actually in it's, it's it's actually to do with clearly when the Prophet's alive, and yeah. to do with Munafikin in his time. <laughs> yeah, and so that's another topic that really needs to be explored: is the audience to which the Quran was revealed to, the people who were listening. You know, like what mm -hmm. was going on, because sometimes, uh, and I know the Hadith tries to provide context. But uh, just from what we know today, it's lacking in a lot of modern sciences that would provide more context. Um, mm. So, you know, I think mm. that's another study. That way we don't try to create our own. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm saying something that, that is uh, unfounded. But, you know, it seems like. Uh, no, the Quran, yeah. the Quran, the Quran at many times is self-explanatory, bro. Hadith 100 percent is there to help as long as you're, mm. as long as you're reading the reliable Hadith and naturally without the motives and stuff but if, as long, generally the quran is clear and if you study the quran by itself without any hadith you will yeah. be guided bro as in the quran's not a book that allah's going to say read the book but and you know people say if you read the book you'll be a stuff for if you read the quran the quran can misguide you that's nonsense bro there's no ayah or nothing like even the ayah they bring to say stuff like that they're actually twisting those verses in reality if you read the quran from the beginning to end bro you'll be guided 
Did you get it? Yeah. You no, no, but pe guided. people people are misguided by that book, though. And I kind of see what, what God is saying. Maybe I, I'm interpreting it wrong, but no, I do see people who are misguided. Oh, I'm sorry? There's, there's, because you know what? It's essentially, Tone, I used to say this. Remember, I think Zariah, but Janine, I, you know, this was the kind of thing that we would get told that if you study the Quran by itself, you can get misguided. Oh, and then no, essentially, no. when you and, and, and then when you actually see those verses that even try and say stuff like that, it's not talking about studying the Quran by itself and get misguided. There's a context for a lot of those things. A lot of the like Allah gives an example about like um, animals or flies, like of little insects, and then Allah actually mentions about it that says that actually I can give this example, and people will use this to misguide themselves. Like Allah's never said if you study the Quran you'll be misguided, but Allah's basically addressing a people who are who don't want to be guided. Now, if, if it's not one of those ones, Torah, if I'm not sincere. And I don't want to be guided. You can give me whatever you want, but I'll misguide myself. It's not God misguiding yeah. you. It's not the book misguiding you. It's the disease no, I, of your heart. Exactly. That's what I meant. I see a lot of Islamophobes misguiding themselves with how they're they... They're misguiding uh, straight <laughs> up. <laughs> the way that they use the Quran. It's like they they're try to use it against themselves. Muslims, but they're using it against, you know, they're only destroying themselves with it. They're destroying their own faith with it. Whatever anyone faith they with, anyone with, a, with, a, with a holistic chronic reading is not going to be upon misguidance, I assure you, man. And that's what... That's, that, that's, that's, that, that's, you know, it's funny, you know what, you know what, essentially, an engineer again mentions this, is that it's funny because according to our scholars, apparently our scholars can write a book, which is clear and you won't get misguided, but Allah couldn't. Just think, let that settle in. That Allah, when he dictates his last testament to humanity, he actually needs you to have like tafsir, otherwise you'll get misguided. But our scholars' books, alhamdulillah, you know, if you read them, you'll never be misguided. <laughs> I have another question. What do you two think? Because I've seen something posted by Khalil and Danny, uh, a chart concerning all the uh, different schools. Oh, yeah, of yeah, I saw that doing the rounds the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he got a lot of crap for adding. Uh, I'm surprised he got crap for adding Salafis, but I think it's more so for the Ahmadis and the Quranists under Sunni, um, which really <laughs> I found a little strange with Quranists myself under Sunni. Maybe I kind of see where he was going. But the thing I was uh, getting at is that a lot of people – uh, I seen commented at least when I posted it on my Facebook. Some people said that Quranists aren't even Muslims. Uh, we, you know, I find that I try to grapple with that because you know we're called to believe in the Prophet, uh, the, the Quran, the Prophet peace be upon him. And it seems like just because you, were, you know, could you call somebody a, a non-Muslim because they uh, reject? My turn. You know, you 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 brought a good topic again. Again, engineers and uh, the same guy who influenced me on these points. When it comes to takfir now, I am not involved. So this is a bit of this ummah that every sect involved with, with takfir. And takfir is something that you should be avoiding at all costs. So I literally see Sunnis, uh, the sects of Sunnis, uh, Shias, the different sects of Shias. I see all of them as Muslim. The only yeah. ones that I'm co confident to believe that someone's not a Muslim is those people that believe that Imam Ali is God, like the sect of the Nusaria and stuff. Yeah. And those people that actually believe in prophets after our prophet. But literally, like literally, that is my limit. Apart from that, anyone in this Ummah for me, they believe in God, they believe in the prophet as the last prophet, they believe in the Quran, they are Muslims. Like, takfir has become a whole different, like, and not, alhamdulillah, I was never a takfir type of guy. But literally, you know, someone who doesn't believe in Imam or someone who doesn't believe in this, no way am I believing in fear in any of those things yeah. in this world and the hereafter, bro. Everyone's a Muslim. Simple right, as that. So, so then that leads to my next question. And something I found interesting in the Zaydi school of Shiism is that they have uh, uh, they, how they treat uh, Muslims who they believe are Fasics. Um, yeah, I saw yeah. this in the Ibadi school, and I believe uh, Mutazila has something like, what is it, Manzala Bain, now Manzala Tain, or something. Sometimes I get the Bain and Tain mixed up again. Yeah, yeah. I'm not an Arabic. <laughs> no, I'm no, not you, Arabic. Was, you was right. I think you was right with that one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> in between two, yeah. All right. And so, uh, and, and yeah, Ibadi's got, uh, yeah, Kufr, Niam. Uh, so, if, okay, you don't make tuck fear on people, but do you think that there should be different categories of believers, though? Because sometimes I grapple with that as well. Like, okay, let's not make tuck fear on, oh, you believe in the prophet, you believe in God is one, the Quran, you know, just like I do. What essentially makes one a, 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 a you know, monotheist. Mm. Uh, but, you know, a Muslim, it seems like, you know, if you, the literal translation is one who submitted. 
Mm. What do you what what would you classify Muslims who or yeah, we'll just call them Muslims. Muslims who haven't who haven't submitted. They say they believe, but they haven't submitted. Do you think we should still classify them as Muslims? I'm asking this because I found I know you came from a twelver background, but I found this in a she uh, the Zaidi school that she's Zaidi background, yeah. That, no, yeah, that you it, don't that you don't call them what well, they say you don't call them a Muslim or you know you don't call them a believer or you don't call them a like something yeah, like that, right? I, I know Ibadi okay, so Ibadis and Zaidis use the same term kufr niyama. They won't call kufr, you kufr the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kufr so nema. you're un ungrateful to God's blessings. Therefore Ibadis, they won't call you a Muslim, they'll call you a monotheist. Won't call you a Muslim because you haven't submitted to to God. Like to submit to, to God, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if Zaydis have that same, but anyway, yeah, they, that, was, they, that was, yeah. General, general, Ibadis and Zaydis are always good to look at because they're both very early readings of Islam, so they're very good to use it, to look at as contextual evidences. Um, my point generally is that there's no doubt there's different degrees of faith. You know, there's the term Mu'min, there's a the term Muslim, there's the famous ayah of the Quran. Those are Arab. They haven't submitted. They just say they believe. You know that famous ayah in the Quran that's used. So there's yeah. definitely degrees of faith. Um, me personally, honestly, I haven't researched it like that, like the way you just discussed it. But all I do say is, and again, I'm literally coming outside my school now. Like I just see everyone as Muslim, bro. If yeah, someone believes in something, if, if if someone believes in something, if they don't, I can disagree. I can say Bartil. But the only like no no sect catches takfir apart from those two that I mentioned to you as a holistic takfir. And I'm sure even someone will debate me on that. But I still have some limits, right? My limit definitely is the prophet being the last. And obviously anyone believing in Imam, Imam Ali's God, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as everyone else, like whether you believe in Imam or whether you don't, et cetera, et cetera, you're a yeah. Muslim. And not only like, not only with the caveat of Muslim in this world, Muslim full stop, bro. There is no Muslim in the head. You're a Muslim here, you're a Muslim there after. Simple as that. You with me? Mm. Yeah. And engineer, engineer was one, and he, he would like, example, and a very good thing about engineer would be was that he would call out like, istighatha of being shirk. So example, he would say, look, Ya Ali Madad, Mudded in Urdu and Farsi, by the way, uh, it means help. I'm sure you don't know that, yeah? So it would be like, you know, anyway, it's like a famous slogan that we say, Ya Ali Mudded, we ask for help. And Janet would call it out, show the proofs against it from the Quran and Sunnah and say, listen, we say the Amal is shirk, but we don't do takfir on the person who, who does it. So that really was like, okay, interesting. You know, all right. So he's like, so then everyone will say, so what, what, so what, what are you trying to say? He's like, you can pray behind them. They're Muslims. You marry into them. We are all Muslims. It's just on this issue, they fell into an amal of shirk, but they are still Muslim. You don't, the hukum of them being mushrikeen is not applied. They are treated like Muslims because they are Muslims. On Yom al Qiyamah, that's between them and God. But they fell into shirk. I mean, they didn't yeah. fall. Uh, uh, wouldn't they just say, that, see, wouldn't you just be better to say that they fell into error? Because if, yeah, you, if you know, to, know, them, I, to them, yeah, they God. didn't fall into shirk. The way they see it, you know, and but, John, you know what? That, 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 that's a that's a, that, um, I'll tell you someone to watch. There's um Dr. Yasser Qadi who's had a, a big he's obviously a very researched guy in this issue, so he's another influence, by the way, for me. Uh, very good, like you know, thinks outside the box. Yes, he's coming, and he was some Dr. Yasser Qadi. You've heard of him, obviously. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think he knows a lot more than what he's conveying because who his <laughs> audience face is. <laughs> you know, I don't think his audience is ready for they're not ready for he knows. They're just about ready for him. They, 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 they just about get over certain things he says now. But Dr. Yasser Qadi, um, what's good about him is he knows this shirk subject inside out, like he's one of the main proponents of in, uh, in the early in the early centuries, calling in the early time period, calling these kind of things shirk. And now he's changed his position, like exactly to what you just said. He says that actually saying, calling out to the Ghera law and stuff, if the intention obviously is clearly not worship and you believe that it's with the, with, with the permission of God, all of that, pretty, which is pretty much what every Shia and Sunni kind of guy who believes in that tradition says, he goes, the hukum would be that it's haram, not shirk. So this is a legitimate discussion to be had, whether it's haram or shirk. I don't deny that. But my point is, even if you believe it's shirk, I would only believe in it like the engineer version, which is, I believe it's the Amal of Shirk. It would never be like, you're out of, because remember, the Salafis take you out of Islam for it, right? Yeah. Engineer's like, nah, you're a Muslim. You hear me? Yeah. And see, the that's why I would like to know the more about the Murjia. The who? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm saying that's why I would like to know more about the Murjia. It seems like they kind of have that position. Uh, I, you know, if anybody knows, I think the Murjia had it to where, like, they're not about to judge any any Muslim 
yeah. based, you know, they're all Muslims, they got to deal with them. Basically, like, we only God be, can judge Yeah, you. like, we, we definitely, like, obviously, look, like, there's no doubt, like I told you, there, there's obviously hudud and limits yeah. uh, within this Oman stuff. But we, 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 we definitely need to be careful of this takfir element because this almost out of control in the takfir element, bro. We are out of control, bro. Did you get it? Yeah, it used to be way more out of control, though. Like, when I first converted, man, people were trigger happy. I remember throwing people out <laughs> the game left and right. <laughs> it was like yeah. WWF, man. WWF, uh, the Royal Rumble. <laughs> yeah, you feel me? That's exactly what the game was like when I came in. So, so, so back to my point, Taryn, about, about Engineer. I was going to say, so he really was a big influence to me because he would, you know, he would, like, literally, like, they out of the Brelvis, the Diobandis, the, the Shias, the Salafis, he would literally critique all of them. And then when someone would ask, so what are you... And he, by the way, he said that he, like, he, he came out of the whole sectarian paradigm. So he would say, actually, I'm not a Sunni as a sect. Having a sect is haram in Islam. It's a bid'ah. I'm Sunni as a manhaj. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. So he would actually say, no, you're not allowed to call yourself a Sunni and Shia as a sect. Allah condemns having a sect. You can have a manhaj, but as a sect, no. And he would critique the hell out of Sunni scholars, Diobandis, Brelvis, Al Hadith. And, and I used to be like, like, that's impressive, bro. And he and, and, and then I started realizing that actually, truth is, if you're going to keep, and this is where the Quran comes involved, because and his his methodology is quite Quran centric. So what was interesting about him is he was very, don't get twisted, he's very reliant on hadith. He's very orthodox in that way. He does not deny hadith like as much as you would think that like others do. Lekin. When it comes to the Quran, he's very Quran centric. He's constantly quoting Quran as it is, and he would always just link it up. And one thing that he would say is that these, like Kisas, these these, these stories of previous like prophets on previous nations, the 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 Jewish and the Christian scholars and stuff. There's a reason Allah's put that in the Quran. Like when we read that, we'll be like, yeah, yeah, that's about Jews and Christians. Or when we read about idol worshippers, we'll be like, and this is what is the common Shia argument. And uh, can, I, can I can I interject for a second, just because yeah, our please. viewers are asking a question, and I think it'd be essential oh. to answer it. Okay, so who is the engineer that you're you're talking about, and um, does he speak in Pakistani or Arabic? Engineer is someone from Pakistan. His name is Engineer Muhammad Ali Mirza. His his actual his actual profession is an engineer. And he has a YouTube channel on YouTube. So you can check him out, Engineer Muhammad Ali Mirza. And uh, he speaks in Urdu and Punjabi. Unfortunately, not Arabic. Um, but obviously, naturally, when he quotes the text and stuff, he'll quote the Arabic and the PDF will come. The PDF scan will come up. So, yeah, unfortunately, the non, the non um, Indo Pak kind of guys that don't understand Arabic, Urdu might not be able to benefit as much. But he's even if you can try and get a gist and feel out of what he's saying, because he's addressed a lot of different different types of topics, and he's really shaken up Pakistan. By the way, he's had two assassination attempts on him. Uh, two times he's um, he's been attacked physically in terms of uh, lethally. They've tried to kill him, and both times it's actually been people from the Sunni background. Okay, wow. Well, thank you, thank you for that. I'm um, sorry, I didn't mean yeah, to interrupt, but and, it was uh, um, constantly being asked. And he's um. He's a pro Al al Bayt type of guy. He has defended the Al al Bayt and talked about the oppression that's happened to them, whether it comes from Muawiya, whether it comes to Yazid. Naturally, he's a Sunni. He defends Sheikhain. He defends Abu Bakr Umar. But even then, if there's some critique that Shias bring, he takes it on board. And at times, he would actually say, actually, the Sheikhain were wrong on these issues. Like, he's actually, he has enough courage to even say that. You with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm following you. So um, he really was a, a big inspiration to me, man. And he still is. I, I, I listen to him all the time. And I just like his freestyle. Like, he's just not linked to any school. And he's got, like, the free hand. Like, he, you can't control the guy, bro. Like, he's not. And because financially, he's independent. This is a very important thing as well. If you're, if you're an imam of a masjid, bro, the community at the end of the day, you're the imam of that community. That masjid, that local committee, they're paying your salary. You're only going to say what your community wants you to say and what you're expected. And that's why it's very important when it comes to religion for you to be financially independent. Because unless yeah, you're financially yeah. independent, you can never say the truth. And Engineer always stresses this. Yeah, the imam I had on yesterday was saying that uh, with a lot of imams at masjids, the board is over them. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, so now if the board's over them and they start critiquing Muawiyah or, or, or some of Uthman's policies or Yazid, 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 Yazid less so, but more companions. Or Yazid yeah. kind of like, if you open up Yazid, that opens up Muawiyah. They'll be like, what are you doing? 
and then <laughs> and open up. Shia, and if a Shia, as an Imam in his masjid, says actually we shouldn't be saying Ali will learn Actually, why are we doing matam? This was like why are we beating our chests? This isn't the way of the Imams. Why are we hitting ourselves with knives? It will be like, uh, yeah, actually, you're not. You you need to leave, mate. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. So basically, as in, and then, and so uh, then, then I started realizing, uh, Terran and Zerob. Zerob, you're still there, yeah? You've been silent for a minute. Yeah, he's there, he's there somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I also realized was that the scholars, when I, when I started referring to the scholars, every type of these practices, Tehran, that I'm that I'm kind of critiquing in the Shia tradition, you know, from Shah to Thalatha in Adan, to stuff like Matam, stuff like Tadbir is the issue, the 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 act of using a knife and striking yourself and stuff like this, and I was like, bro, this is this is clearly like wrong and un-Islamic. You would find a scholar, an ayatollah, saying it's allowed. So a Shia has like a leeway because he's like, yeah, you know, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Wazar. But at the end of the day, bro, my scholar says it's allowed. So the I started realizing that no matter what kind of innovation that you bring in the school, the scholars the scholars are justifying it. Right? So as essentially, you cannot rely on the scholarship because the scholarship essentially is compromised. I'm not saying and actually every single one of them, but I'm saying just yeah. generally, they're basically out of them, Muhammad Hassan Najafi, Daku Sahib, he was one of the only ones to this day that calls out Shah the Talat and Adan. And generally, he's a disputed, hated, controversial um, a personality in Shia circles just because he's speaking the truth. So speaking the truth, no matter what sect, so a Sunni speaks the truth in his sect, a Shia speaks the truth in his sect, no one's going to like you, bro. No. Do you get it? Yeah. You're not, it's you're that not group thinking mentality. I'll give, you, I'll, give, I'll give you a good example. I was just talking about it on the group a little while ago. Sayyid Sistani, who's one probably you've obviously heard his name, one of the biggest marja in Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. Like of the of the Shia world. You've heard that name, right? Sayyid Sistani. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's biggest. He recently had a meeting with the Pope. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh the issue of Tadbir is rampant. So Tadbir obviously striking yourself with, with a sword in the grief of Imam Hassan. So something that started off as legitimate grief has now ended up with something clearly bottled, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. instead of Sayyid Sistani, when, when Sayyid Sistani is asked about that issue, he doesn't give a thought about it. He says, actually, I'm not going to comment on it. <laughs> Serious. But you know what? Yeah, this is a, a very interesting question. You know, uh, this issue of computers, obviously, as you said, a rampant, pervasive one in Iraqi and in Shia communities. And it's, it's uh, massive. harmful. Uh, I mean, the thing we can say is massive, but it's also harmful. That's the point. 100%. Now, and and Sayyid Sistani would just say, actually, I'm someone, opinion. What was it? For someone with that much uh, clout, for someone with that much that much reach and that much kind of um, influence on that community to, to be silent on such an issue, it raises serious questions. Because what I'm saying is even, for example, someone like the Pope, yeah, he got a lot of um, backlash and a lot of um, pushback on his decision to stay silent on the, um, or kind of advocate for the use of birth control, for example, in like, and the influence that would have on you know, many different uh, health issues. So it's a health issue as well, do you know what I'm saying? And not to mention, of course, like, um, yeah, uh, more controversial topics. But to kind of draw that parallel, for example, yeah, with HIV and AIDS and so on and so forth, and the influence that he could have on societies to almost to, to have a check or to kind of push that back a little bit. You know, he chose not to do it for a long time. And the, and, and the institution was rightly criticized for it. What I'm saying is, for someone like the, the, high, the highest office in terms of Marajah, in the Shia, uh, really, uh, at the, the highest point of religious reference, it raises a very big problem of who is he actually competent? Like, and I don't mean to say that in the sense of uh, someone on the outside. I'm just saying, uh, when I was listening to, for example, um, Ahmed al Khatib, yeah, he was mentioning how, you know, there's reports and pe the whispers and, and, and rumors or, so, or, or whatever that people in his office or his students and people that are around uh, Sistani are the ones that actually write the tower. So there's a lot of religious rulings which are suspect or questionable or whatever. So not only the omissions or not only the silences, for example, from the issue of Tadir, or hitting yourself uh, in lamentation for the, for the death of uh, Hussein, you know what I'm saying? The moment of but saying, issues yeah. like other, other issues, isn't it? You've got other issues yeah. which 
uh, a fatwa, a fatwa would be written, and yeah, I'm saying is is he, he the one? He, that, when he's asked about the fatwa, you know sorry, he's not giving the fatwa. He's saying no, I'm not. I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna say it's allowed or haram. It's like, well, there, there, there you go. In it, I, I know someone will say yeah, but that's just understand the mindset from there. Like, you're not on speaking the truth on these issues, are you? Do you get my point? Yeah, of course. Because naturally, you're going to lose following or people are going to go against you. Shahad, that, that's why, if you're, you know, Shahad the Thalitha, you know, the third testimony of the Dhan, saying Imam Ali's name, as in, how can I measure you for truth when you can't even call that out? <laughs> yeah. And that's not even a big, like, all your early scholars called it out. Like, it's really not a big deal to call it out and say, bro, just stop this. Stop adding stuff to the religion and stop playing around. It's not a big thing to say. But yet, in Shia circles, like, nah, bro, you know. It's Imam Ali's name. It's like it's just emotional rhetoric, right? Mm, yeah. So clearly, there, there, there's a problem, and, and and there's a problem, and the problem is coming from the top because the scholars are endorsing these things, right? Mm, yeah. So it's not like you know, it's not like some local kind of Molvi on the on in in, in 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 as an Imam in a mosque talking talking this, and the followers doing it. It's not it's not like a isolated community in a village in Pakistan. Actually, whatever acts they're doing. A lot of the Maraja on top are endorsing it. They 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 they're not. And then and then one of the one of the other things that I wanted to say was that one of the um, one of the key elements also in my changing in terms of like the way my mindset changed was actually having some sort of consistency where I actually started applying Rajah standards. So I know obviously with Sunni standards, Sunnis apply like you know they. Are, they have the concept of applying Sahih chain. Salafis have definitely pushed this uh, strongly in the Sunni tradition. Um, so in the Shia school, in the Twelver school, this is not a very common phenomenon to basically apply Rajal standards. So example, you'll notice a lot of Shias generally just quote text from their sources without actually applying Rajal methodology, actually saying, is the Sanad Sahih? Uh, most of the problem actually gets cut off when you apply Sahih Sanad on it. You do realize that. So if someone's like, oh, but this hadith says you can do istighatha, it's like, is it sahih? Oh, it's not. Okay, then I'm not interested. Do you get it? Mm, mm. If you actually start applying Rajal standards, you know, you can't prove that imams are doing matam, let alone tadbir. You can't prove istighatha. All these topics go, bro, automatically. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So basically, the definitions of bid'ah had to change for me. The definitions of shirk, the, the, the the definition of shirk had to change because the definition of shirk was basically as long as you believe whatever you do and ever, as long as you believe that imams are dependent on God, it essentially can't be shirk. So, you know, once you've opened that caveat, bro, you can pretty much have any belief as long as you say, well, the imam's dependent on God. So it's not really shirk, is it, bro? So then why was there a um, non-imam or non rijali approach? To make the, why was there? To these ideas? Why was there a non rijali approach? As in a, a non critical non approach. Non approach, yeah, non approach yeah, is, 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 is from our, it's from our bad. It's from our again. It, <laughs> it's coming from the top, bro. The the top scholars are doing it. They they're doing istidlal from things that are no way sahih, bro. Naturally, the the awam nas is doing it. The the the, the member. So, but, but, but Reza, what I'm asking you is, okay, so if it's coming from the top and the scholars are having a non rijali approach, why is yeah. that? Okay, as in, as in, it's for example, okay. it's comparing okay. it, com okay, so for example, comparing it to, uh, what's the birth and, and, I mean, obviously as briefly as possible, but like, oh, what's the birth right? and, and, and development, yeah, because this is the point, is, was it, if either there was a default position, um, well, I mean, it's not either, in it, but I'm saying there was a default position, this is my view, of, of Akhbarism, where there the Shias weren't really interested in a Rijali approach, and that wasn't their major consideration. Their major considerations were other things. Uh, they placed emphasis on other things as opposed to the Rijali in the chain. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll, tell you so, I'll, tell you I'll tell you something very interesting. The early Shia scholars, um, whether it's debated in the circles whether they were applying some sort of Rijal or not, but I'll tell you something. Let's go with the view they were. And they were using other contextual evidences to decide if the narration they've had, they, they've been, they've received is actually from the imam. So they had some other contextual evidences at their time period. If you compare what their beliefs were and what they believed then, um, and just generally their approach, and if you compare it with the guys today who apply Rajal, 
you'll notice that actually early Shia scholars like Sheikh Saduq and these lot, they were not believing in half the stuff we believe in today. So whether he believed in Rajal or not, the point is he was able to reach a position that was clearly a non ghlu non bid'ah position. Sheikh Saduq, Zayab, Sheikh Saduq would deny Imams having ilm al ghaib bro. <laughs> okay. And so my point and is other, that yeah, other yeah, so it, to say he was wrong on that. Well, early Shiism wasn't recognizing Ilm al Ghaib until later, bro. Did you get it? That's interesting. And that sounds Shia's in an opposition to, to modern Shiism. Uh, of course, it's evolution, isn't it? Uh, hundred, is that, these are clear evolutions. And if someone wants to justify evolutions, then good luck to you, right? But, but the point is, is that the, the evolution was happening. And that's why today's scholars, it becomes more necessary it's, to apply it's being knowledge. Just quickly, ilm al qay being knowledge of the unseen. Knowledge of so, the unseen that well, God well, what's gives being said the here is that the, 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 that the early Shias, like someone like, um, who did you say it was? Sheikh Saduq, Ramatullah Sheikh Saduq, right. Okay, so someone like Saduq didn't believe that Imams had knowledge of the unseen, whereas no, no, today, no, no, no. it's pretty much a normative, you could say, normative Shia belief. And you know what, you just, reminded me, of you just reminded me of a couple of, um, a couple of points on this. So the modern-day Shia scholars, the modern day Shias, if you're not going to apply Rajal standards, then it's going to be a mess. And that's why you have the mess in front of you. Now, let me tell you something. That's why everything can be justified because you can just quote any narration. You know how it works, Zariyab. Open Open Bihar and War. It says Bihar says this. But it's yeah. like, yeah, but why is that important yeah. what Bihar says? <laughs> Let's check. Now, now check this in. Uh, check this, uh, Zariyab. In regards to a couple of other people that are de definitely a couple of incentives that have definitely helped me. So there's a, there's a website called um, Shia Reform. Uh, definitely a good website, man. Shia Reform is a serious website. Very good. Um, yeah, we can you, put it in you, the you, description. You, I know that website. Yeah, you, yeah, we can add it. You, you obviously know about it. Shia Reform. Um, very good. Talks about loads of different different types of things. Ghulu, Bid'ah, Shirk. Uh, asking Allah for help. Loads of Shia practices that have become rife. And breaks them down. So it's a really good website as an understanding. As in, this, as a basic this is the same understanding. One that, that mentions, it mentions Ahmed al a few times. Yeah, 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 naturally. And it, it talks about Sheikh Saduq's yeah, view. Yeah, yeah. They've got a PDF yeah. on Ghulu as well. Very good. It talks about Ilm al Ghaib, asking Allah for help, everything. It talks about from the Quran. It's very Quranic, quote, quote, Quranic verses, hadith, everything. So it's a very good website. So that's a very good thing that I learned from. Uh, that's one website. Another initiative that's actually quite recent. So I've been listening to them recently is a YouTube channel called Al Islah. Al Islah. Um, and uh, Zerub, you know, I told you about the minute. Yeah, we can put that in the link in the, in the chat as well. I think he, the the person on the channel is, is am I right in believing he's, he, the video you sent me, he was responding to Modarasi. Yeah, Modarasi so right criticizing now. his video. Yeah, so right now, it's, and it's a very, very good example because Sayyid um, uh, Kampuri, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but that's, yeah, Sayyid Ali Kampuri, He's doing great work, mashallah. Like he's come out and now he's actually targeting the things that I'm actually talking about now. And <clears throat> the minute he's come out to discuss it, you've got Shia scholars coming out and attacking him, bro. And we're talking about the equivalent of like, I think I don't know too much about Madarasi, but he's he reminds me a bit of Umar Suleiman. You know about the minute. About who, 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 what Suleiman? You know, Omar Suleiman. Oh, yeah, yeah, Omar Suleiman. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. The very um speaker in, uh, in, Suleiman, in, yeah. in America, right? In the US, yeah, exactly. He yeah, but, gives me that kind of vibe for some reason. He gives you that vibe. Yeah. The, the thing with Sayyid Malarasi is he's, um, he's like a proper from the house and stuff. So he's from the circles, right? Like he's from the circle. So as you can see in the, if you watch the back to back between them two, you can just see that bro, like Sayyid Malarasi is fuming. Like he's angry, disrespectful all, all over the place. So and the other was, guys, just as a quick point, what was he responding to? As in, what concept is it? One of the concepts you've mentioned already. That yeah, loads, bro. You know, well, Sayyid Kampuri's highlighted loads of different concepts. One of the concepts we've been discussing the concept of you know you have to believe in the imam, otherwise you know you're a kafir or you're a or you're a kafir. Sayyid Kampuri's like, nah, this is later the evolution. Some stuff is like calling Imam Ali for help. These kind of all these kind of things, Sayyid Kampuri's, he's got loads of lectures and videos. He's put in hours of work, hours of research, and um, he's done really. He's negated Wilayat the Queen, the Imams have the powers to control, you know, all this kind of has been negated. And 
instead of actually saying, you know what, amazing work, someone's finally done the job of a scholar, he's getting jumped on. And very in, in a very disrespectful manner. Very interesting. Well, quickly, can I get you to, to kind of outline, and it's, I see it in this, uh, outline the problems of, of an Akhbari approach, or kind of talk about the pros and cons of, of both approaches, because I know you're critical of, you're not, you're not really belonging to either or. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I, give I, us some, I, I, some pros and cons of, of the Usuli approach and the Akhbari. Yeah, no, I, I'll highlight. So naturally, like you said, they have both have pros and cons, but like brother, I can see a common brother, Anan, Usuli is blindly from a scholar. And there's no doubt, and this is, by the way, that's, that's another problem, Taklid. <laughs> that's another problem, bro. Taklid is a problem, and Asulis have mandated that. Um, so you see, naturally, even back in the day when I was more, as you could say, orthodox, I was opposing Taklid because I was like, hold on. And by the way, just to let everyone know that, just so that everyone's clear and people don't get things. <clears throat> I left bag a little while ago, Bet Tagadir, so I don't want no one to be like, oh, yeah, you know, because, you know, imagine Shias will be like, okay, well, He's speaking against scholars and this and that. Bag are, as you can say, free from my views. They're not, <laughs> they're not on my views. Yeah, so my views are my views. Their views are their views. But yeah, put I left a little disclaimer on that. The... Yeah, put a disclaimer, man. I left <laughs> them a little while ago. So my views are my All views. Right. <laughs> my views are my views. So, um, the, the 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 brother Anna just mentioned the Asuli approach is very good in the sense that um, they apply Rajal. They're actually applying Rajal standards and they've got a Rajal methodology. So you can actually check if the chain is say. So that's a very good thing. Uh, Akhbari's negative is, well, they don't. <laughs> You're not applying. Now, naturally, and it's a broad a, spectrum. That's a big, it's a broad big spectrum. negative. Yeah, yeah, it's a broad spectrum, Zaryab. You might find an Akhbari that does apply Rajal, but I'm talking very loosely and generally. Akhbaris that don't apply Rajal, they're in trouble. Asulis that apply Rajal are very good. However, however, Asulis have now come across uh, ways to get around issues. So, example, you'll be like, but if that's the case, why are all these Asuli scholars then allowing all this stuff that's clearly not proven from, say, Hadith? Because then they've made up Asul. They've made up Asul that allow them then to use weak Hadith. So it's like Asulis using Asul to basically promote Akhbarism. Do you get that point or no? You're going to you're gonna have to break that down. Yeah, so example, example. There's weak hadith in praise of the Prophet's family. There's some weak hadith on praise of Al-Bayt, yeah? In, okay, there's some, okay uh, there's some weak hadith that yeah. praise them. The, the Asuli scholar will say, yeah, look, these hadith are weak. However, we have an Asul that states that when you're praising someone, the hadith doesn't have to be strong, so this weak, weak hadith can be accepted. Mm. So you see what they've done would there? It work, would it, well, yeah, yeah. And would it work the same way for Istakata, for example? Exactly. Thank you. Because now they'll say, yeah, well, Istagash is, uh, Istagash is generally an accepted practice. So, and then you'll be like, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You haven't even proved Istagash left. Forget using weak hadith. First, prove the concept, Habibi. True? <laughs> yeah. What are you yeah. talking about weak hadith, bro? Prove it. the concept first. Yeah, you can't take it as a given. And this is, so this is Asulis using Asul and misusing Asul. So Asul can be used in sure. a good way. Yeah. Uh, one of the scholars that are very good are Sheikh Khubullah, Shia scholar. Uh, uh, by the way, another website. Uh, so hold on. I've, I've mentioned Shia reform, Islam, Thakalain. Uh, big up, shout out to Hayden. Yeah, yeah. Shout uh, out big up to Hayden. Definitely put that in the description. That's a, he's a, definitely put that. He's a real, he's a real mujahid. Like his website and stuff, he deals with a lot of this kind of stuff. So it's like Asuli scholars will be using these Asul to kind of base like, yeah, well, now you can use this. And yeah, so what if it's weak? Um, we've got this principle that states that actually in acts that are, um, so if there's a hadith that says, they'll, they'll say stuff like, if something's a meritous act, al-fadal yeah. al-amal, if an act's meritous, so it says, you know, I don't know, pray 50 rakat tonight and you get this tawab. Sure. They'll say, yeah, look, Raza, the, the hadith's weak, but at the end of the day, the act's a meritous act. And we have yeah. concept that states that a meritous act doesn't, uh, for a meritous act, you don't need to say hadith, you can use weak. You see, again, another another problem. Sure. Because now you're misusing Asul. <laughs> they're misusing Asul. And when you're misusing Asul, sure. naturally it can be a problem. So the problem is not the Asul. It's the misuse of the Asul. With Akhbarism, it's and like, bro, oh, that, that tradition. Yeah, Akhbarism, yeah no, go on. Go, go on to the Akhbarism. Go on. The Akhbarism. Some, some modern modern examples of both camps. Yeah, so, so yeah, nowadays you won't find anyone openly saying I'm an Akhbari. But what they're doing is they're using the Asuli framework to basically say, look, I'll give you an example. Tafsir Kummi is a book of Tafsir, yeah? 
Uh, Sayyid Khui had an authentication mistake when he said basically, you know, all of the narrators in Tafsir Kumi are authenticated or whatever. That's when Akhbar is like, Akhbar is like, yeah, cool. That's cool. I'm, do, I'm cool now. I'm an Asuli, but I'm using Sayyid Khui's methodology and all of Tafsir Kumi is sahih for me. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, Zarab, as far as Akhbarism today is concerned, it has no merit. If you're not applying Rajal today in Shia texts, because remember, Zarab, I've already, I've already conceded that we have a lot of fabrications yeah. and like wrong stuff in our books. So if you're not going to apply Rajal, bro, you're going to end up in a mess. Do you get it? Sure, and, and academics, especially Shia academics, to recognize this. So. And that, and, and, some of them are trying to save it, though. For example, for example, just yeah. trying to give it an example of Kitab Sulaim. There's been attempts to save Kitab Sulaim when it seems to, to, to have no provenance in the sense of it has no authentic oh yeah sorry, 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 sorry. Just no, no, just no, no, authentic, no authentic point of it actually being written by someone or no it was written by this person it seems like it was written and added to and it wasn't a fixed text until much later and then supposedly yeah. but there's, there's some Shia scholars I know in, in academia who have tried to and I think that Alain has carried one of these articles which have tried to say it's absolutely yeah yeah it, uh, Hader is the guy for this man Hader is the guy because he's translated a lot of this stuff and putting a lot. And look again, Hader's Hader's a, a young brother putting in work himself. He's not endorsed by scholars, bro. He's having to put the work in himself. And by the way, Hader's another one, bro. Yeah, yeah. How many men go for his website? Oh, he's this, he's that. You see, the minute you start, <laughs> like, the minute you start critiquing the thing, suddenly the not so the nice people become ugly, right? Yeah, yeah, it happens on all sides. Yeah, yeah, of course. I know it happens. So back, back back to the point, just the, the, the point that I was making. Um, uh, what was it? About Akhbaris and some... some yeah, Akhbar, as far as Akhbaris are concerned, yeah. they have, in today's century, uh, as a Rab, apart from the fact of apply, you have to apply Rajal, you also have to compare with the Quran, bro. It's very important. It's not just enough for a hadith to be sahih, bro. It, does it go with the theme of the Quran? This is Alhamdulillah, we have a soul from Al Bayt that actually a lot of schools don't even have. It's a blessing that we've got this concept. But it's not being used. Do you get it? How do you mean? Um, meaning, in, in, meaning in, if, what, if, I say, if, if I showed you a say hadith that said stuff like, if I showed you a say hadith that said, you know, it's the God. Like that. <clears throat> All the, ima the imams were knowledgeable. All the imams, oh yeah, here's a good one. The imams have Power. full knowledge of the unseen. Yeah, the imams have full knowledge of the unseen. Doesn't take a genius to be like, oh, the Quran, clearly, the Quran clearly negates this. Look at the life of the Prophet. What full knowledge of the unseen are you talking about, bro? Read the Quran. True. Yeah, exactly. We, exactly. we have the Prophet saying, "I have no knowledge of the unseen." No, no, but but everything like that is twisted, and interpreted to mean, oh no, but he's not independent. Like they've got this, they've got, <laughs> they they've already their preconceived beliefs, and then they apply it to the Quran rather than doing it the other way around. Do you get it? Yeah. So basically, you know, the, the Akhbari methodology in today has, so when the, the brother talking about, the brother said, you know, uh, oh, well, Asul is due to blind following. Yeah, that's true. And that's something that, that's not, not nothing, that's not really, that needs to be condemned. And that should be, Taqlid is not something that you should be doing. Taqlid is dangerous, bro. Yeah, and that's actually what attracted me to the body school is that they were against Taqlid. Uh, because I, I agree. Oh, so, uh, blind you're, following. Uh, you're, 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 um, you're attracted to the body school, I mean, you're going to have a problem, bro. Oh yeah, you know, straight from yeah. the nah. <laughs> Stay Sunday, bro. Stay Sunday, bro. <laughs> nah, I mean, I do got their lean, but see, a lot of the positions that attracted me to uh, Ibadia, you see, in a lot of early schools such as the Matezla and the Zaidi, you know. You know, Ibadism is good as an early reading because you're able to pick up things uh, because it's an early reading, so you're able to pick up a lot of contextual evidences. So it's very useful. Example, I'm going to use their bodies in my own proof. I'm going to use them as my own proof now. You know how they pray, right? Yeah, yeah, hands to the side. Thank you, bodies, for giving for, for giving us that one. Is that right? Because oh, yeah, yeah. Way, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Took you a little while, yeah. but you got there, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that this has been a really, really interesting conversation, especially um, the insights into your progress and uh, I say progress but your development your journey that's what opens the project. 
Hundred percent, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that a you lot of interesting gave topics me the opportunity, yeah. man. Like, I would love to. We should continue, man. We should continue another day. Continue, like, it's. A, I, I like Brother Terrence's channel. You man are on the same vibe. It's good, man. Oh yeah, man. And I'm, I'm not saying. Like... Uh, yeah, I'm not saying necessarily you have to cut off now. Um, oh yeah, no, fair what enough. I'm yeah, saying yeah, is that enough. the in the, the interview section, I think, to kind of have um, you know, we can start another one um, if, if Terrence still about. But, yeah, um, yeah, we can make it a series. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. This could be the first installment. Very first installment, man. But I think, look, the main thing is, is that I think a lot of um, a lot of people are. I think one of the biggest things about this whole thing is that it's all about approaches. And for all the times I was in the polemics field, and just generally, like a lot of the behaviors that I got, and a lot of the opponents, interlocutors, and stuff, they really should have like challenged like they should have really channeled themselves better because like i'll give you an example can you imagine that out of all people that would have ended up making me change my stances would have been someone called sunni someone sunni called engineer from pakistan like he's the one eventually who made me change my stances and he's not shia bro do you get my point and he ended up changing my stances so the point is is that yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. It, uh, the approach is very important and you know, and just, just just how you come across with your sincerity. And I think people need to reflect that we're in this field uh, that potentially actually push people more towards staying upon bottom. You know, like I would love to speak to people and invite them and say, actually, you know what, man? If I speak to Shias, I always, I teach my family members. I teach other people, like, don't call the imams for help, only call Allah for help. I always teach these things now. But the point is, wouldn't it have not been nice if a Sunni spoke to me and taught me this nicely and I would have learn a lot better i had to learn from engineering and I'm, I'm glad i'm glad and grateful i'm just saying people should reflect on their methodology and their their dawah practices right yeah sure if, if yeah. their ultimate intention was to you know have that effect, but as we kind of touched upon earlier the, the motivations for getting into the polemical scene is is usually self-aggrandizement or, or, or self enrichment um and and I say that you know, I mean slightly hesitantly, but what 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 I see is um, benefits being accrued through being in the polemic in the scene of polemic, and it's not so much a focus on like he was talking about having reasons. And to be fair, there's not you know there's always exceptions, but the exception proves the rule. So I think with the approaches, I think. It, it, it's only when you kind of have a real view on what that was should be like, what calling to Islam should be like, yeah? and move away. I think the, the pamphlet Islam thing is, is done. It's been done for a very long time. So all of these Dawah dudes, ultimately, if you even look at someone like the trajectory of someone like Dawah, he's gone mm -hmm. from uh, a lot of people being interested to now just, just, you know, doing what he's doing on the side over there. So... And that's that, that someone, and I only mentioned him because it's someone who is like emblematic of that Dawah scene. You know, you know the whole um, YouTubeization of Dawah is, you know, as a lot of young people came to the polemical scene through these kind of characters. So what mm. ultimately happens is that these characters are created. That's what it is. These characters, characters are created. It's like, it's like a yeah, film. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. They are really and then the real work, the real work is done in, you know, like with all these different people that we've mentioned that are actually doing the work, and they're the ones that have an effect. Um, and, and ultimately, you see the results and the effect. You know? So if you're seeing the, the, the effect of people like people that you mentioned, the engineer, that you would imagine, like, that that was really, really I'm saying if they were really, really sincere, all these different groups would be like, let's take a leaf out of that book. You know what I'm saying? But obviously, exactly. That, is it? He's he's one of the most hated guys in uh, Pakistan and India, the, the kind of cities, because there's not one sect scholars he's left alone. <laughs> like he's yeah, literally he's all, of, all of them, is it? And 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 and, 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 and bro, I'm still Shia, but I love that energy where he's like, bro, like I can go against anyone, bro. Here's the Quran, here's the Sunnah, let's go. Do you get it? Yeah, of course. There's no hierarchy, bro. He'll go against everyone. Like it's it's not an issue. And essentially that that that's what we need to come down to. As in, are we following? Do we want to follow follow 
what we are born upon just because of our forefathers? Because is it a coincidence that no matter what sect you're born into, eventually you're like, I've done my research and that sect's correct? <laughs> or should you be actually questioning things? Yeah, Here's a controversial cool. one right here. Uh, since we're on the topic of Dawah, guys, what's your thoughts yeah. on Muhammad Hijab due to his recent controversy with Mufti Abu Lay? Uh, I guess I'll go first. I mean, he redeemed himself by he redeemed himself to a certain extent by condemning what had happened after he had put that video out. So I congratulate him on that. But you know, he kind of did make takfir on two uh, two Muslim two Muslim scholars, I guess, uh, you know, which I found to be problematic. And the fact that the Palestine topic is a very hot one right now and a very sensitive one amongst lots of, lots of Muslims, you know, for him to put out a video like that and say all the things he said was in, definitely in bad taste. Yeah, that was, uh, it's really sad, man, that Mufti Abu Lay thing, man, half of the law, Allah protect him and his family is, um, it's devastating to watch, man. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah Allah, bro, it breaks my heart, man. It's, it's, he's such a, and you know what's interesting? Like, Mufti Abu is such a nice person, bro. Like, he really is a genuine nice person. Like, Wallah, he's Zoyab knows, like, I'm on the opposite spectrum to him. I'm Shia. And, like, Abu Leif's just on the other side. Like, he's not even bothered about this kind of stuff. And his views at so many times oppose mine. But that's you did never. An interview with him, isn't it? I done a whole interview with him, by the way. You see, have you seen that um, thing? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, like, it was such a nice vibe, bro, and he really does care. He's just a genuine guy, and... I believe he's invited Muhammad Hijab to his house as well. Uh, and he's invited everyone, him. bro. He's, he's ready to talk to everyone, bro. He's a confident guy about what he believes. He's clearly sincere in what he believes. And, you know, the fact that he can, you know, the fact that he can give, he can say a statement and then stuff for law, bro. People do that to his house. I know. Like, it's just a, atrocious, bro, and Honestly, bro, like I'm still in shock, man. I can't. I, it's so sad, man. It's so sad, bro. Honestly, people need to take heed from this and take Nasir from it. That actually, words have like words do have they like words have a reaction, and people that were that were making videos about him, posting stuff, this and that, they need to now think about what the what what this has resulted in, and played and played their part. And Muhammad Job, at least he at least he condemned those people and said, "I'm free from this," which is fair, but. The next stage is to reflect on, you know, our words, especially if you're big dawah guys that have influence. People, you know, what things that you can say, people's families can get affected, man. People, it's really dangerous. Definitely. No, I agree. And oh, yeah, but yeah, before I forget, Zero, before I forget. And, and underline, underline that point. But, you know, when we think about what you just said there, it is, it is working, it does work all the way around. But to be honest, I have to think about um, you do have to think about the, the truth, so to speak, as well. Despite us putting a, a period and a full stop at the end of that, drawing a line underneath it, it still needs to be said that the manner in which, and he was, he, it must be fair to him, he did admit it in the video, you know, where he's like, I could have chosen my words in one particular, in one, yeah, in one particular mm -hmm. segment, which was yeah, used the against him, ultimately. Yeah, that's the whole what point. Muslim, what but nevertheless, Muslim I think it was. I think it was important that he recognized he can be a better communicator or, or, or not slip up with not have slips of the tongue in that sense so to not allow for this to be weaponized against him. Because that's and what happened. Said, he, and and, and Zorob, let's, he, he had a mistake, he had a slip of a tongue. So what, you go attack his house? <laughs> well, no, of course. That's why That's why you make a, make a, like, what you said was sufficient. You know, you, we put a full stop on that, but. Like I say, and um, before I forget this, I, I, I want to make sure I say this. I think so, I want to make sure I say this because it's going to bother me. If I forget, it's going to bother me uh, later. Say that again. If, I, if I forget, it's going to bother me later. So basically, you just want to put out okay, a, disclaimer, yeah, yeah, yeah. a disclaimer. All my old views on, you know, I was obviously doing the polemics, which is fine, but you see all my old views on Estagatha and stuff like that. Like, I do Raju and I do Toba from all those type of views. So I'm not upon any of that no more, man. Like I'm a Shia, alhamdulillah, but when it comes to that kind of stuff of istighatha or anything like that or any of those kind of opinions, like I'm completely, I've completely done a review on that, Toba, and I'm now I'm free from all those views, man. And scholars, Miraja, this and that, bro, like don't link me with any of these scholars of today, bro. I'm not linked to any of these scholars. 
unless they're speaking truth and facts. Simple as that. You with me? So it's important that I say that because I'm the one that with, with the videos out. <laughs> People will say to me, yeah, but Rosa, you done a video this to go after. I was like, yeah, that was three years ago, bro. I've changed now. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to hear. <laughs> well, you know, then that's the beautiful thing. We can all redeem ourselves. It's never too late until we die. So, you know. 100%, and man. I've, I've I, said the website's where to go. I, I know where. I've told you lot. It's law. It's law. Thakka Lane, Shia Reform. Inshallah, put these lot on your link. Um, definitely some good stuff there, man. Inshallah, all the brothers will benefit. The the Shia audience will benefit, and the non-Shia audience will also benefit because they'll be like, "Wow, like there are Shias fighting this battle." Yeah, yeah. If you if you don't mind if you don't mind putting it in the private chat, I'll uh, I'll I'll put them in the description uh, so other people can uh, see for themselves. Yeah, let me, let me let me start doing that now. Yeah, let me start doing that now. In the private chat, yeah. Yeah, I've made a note. I've made a note of in, of two of them. If you can mention the WordPress, you know the WordPress site, with the banner, which is good. So what? Um, um, Shia reform, uh, Shia reform, Shia reform Isla, reform, and Takalain. That was it. Yeah, now I've noted them now. So Takalain got blocked. Yeah. There. But yeah, we can unwind for a little bit, five like ten minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, man, brothers, man, that's that's pretty we'll much. That's pretty much the narrative, man. But um, yeah, man, it's uh, it's refreshing, man. It's refreshing to be thinking outside the box. Um, no, it definitely it is. It is refreshing to think outside the box. And I remember when I first converted, I, it, it was such a terrible thing to imagine Islam being more than the narrative I was upon. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as I grew, it took me How about. Did you tell, like, what narrative did you did you go into? Hardcore Salafism or what? Yeah, yeah, I didn't call myself a Salafi. But I was definitely probably could have been considered a Wahhabi because I was reading a lot of uh, Muhammad you call, Ibn you call Abu Wahhab. Just talking to me, huh? What's up? Oh yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would have never talked to no Shia. <laughs> Sufis were non-Muslims as well. They were just pretending to be Sunni. I used to say all the all the most wild stuff. <laughs> you know. I used to say all the wild stuff, and I feel bad too because you know what? A lot of the people who I used to say this to, they're they're still like they held they held on with me, and they're still friends with me today. So you know, I'm I'm happy that they were patient with me. Uh, they understood I was a convert, and I was reading like limited literature and painting it like that's all of what Islam was. But um, mm. the w the way I'm thinking today, it makes me even more confident in the deen than uh, before. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, Darren, that's really powerful what you said there because that's what a lot of people are afraid of. If they step away from their particular group, that there will be a void, that they won't be able to fit and that they will lose. That's faith, exactly what it is. Example. You know what I'm saying? And and like you mentioned it earlier, Jose, it's a very human instinct to be a part of a group and stuff, but the search for truth is not belonging to any one particular group. And I think there's one thing that to my head, which he says is always rings in my head. Make make the search for truth, or um, yeah, make the search for truth more important than belonging, or something to that effect, right? So even though we have a core essence where we need a sense of belonging, ultimately the search for truth is beyond that. So I think it's really powerful what he said there. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The search for truth needs to be the main objective, not um, pleasing mm -hmm. a sect or just supporting a group of um, a collection of ideas or mantras or talking points. Yeah, and Janet actually talk, talks about not calling yourself a sect. Just call yourself Muslim. Yeah, I, I use school of thought a lot better. Uh, yeah, as in, as in, I understand you've got you something. He says the word manhaj, you say school of thought. But as a general, I'm a Muslim, and then obviously, naturally, it's like, okay, so, you know, so everyone wants to know, what are you? What are you? So you can kind of say, look, as school of thought, I'm this, but I'm a Muslim, bro. Like, and it's, but you can put that in there, but at the same time, our primary thing should be we're Muslim, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think, I think it works in, in opposite, in the sense that you become more, you become more ingratiated with a sense of uh, identity when you step away from... Uh, you know, the you know, and Jeanette says the same thing. He says that if you go today and you go to a masjid in Pakistan and you go to a Diobandi, Ali Hadid, Shia, uh, Brelvi Mosque and you say, they say, what sect are you? And you say, I'm a Muslim. They'll look at you and say, what sect is that? What, what, what the hell is that? Like, what do you mean you're Muslim? What sect are you? <laughs> they'll say, well, and they'll be like, well, and we're coffee. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> because they're not used to that. <laughs> they're like, what yeah, are we coughing? Yeah, that's, that's just what it is. It's normality and what we're accustomed to. We need to, we need to go back to that. We need to go back to the basics, man. And, and, and everyone can have their own school of thought and their thing and then discuss things, man. But they're, they're, as in all this, you know, you can't pray behind them. You can't do this. It's all nonsense, bro. It's all nonsense, bro. I'm not saying deviance and al bidah doesn't exist. I'm saying this concept of you can't pray behind them, you can't do this. It's all nonsense, bro. Right, like I say, hopefully we'll get you back on. And um, Aaron was very kind to host us today. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is the spot. Tehran's the hot. Tehran's got the hot spot. This is this is the channel. No, nah, no, nah, no. I mean, it really has been uh, my pleasure because uh, when Ziriab told me about you and that you wanted to come on, I was excited, uh, especially because I, I again I, I'm, I was familiar with you already, and mm. to hear a story like this uh, is truly phenomenal. Because um, it seems like all of us kind of have the same similar story yeah. uh, going on. So. I think Zayab's probably, 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 probably the only one that's been on this for a hot minute. Zayab's been always been like a lone soldier. Yeah, yeah, and I've been following him for a while too. I can't even, I can't even imagine Zayab being zealous. I can't even imagine being Zayab being <laughs> hardcore some type of yeah, guy. I can't even there was a time. That. There was a time. Once upon a time. <laughs> Zayab, you know when yeah, I first yeah, came yeah. on the scene, I think you had let's a little jump, bit of ego. What was that, Ruz? Ruz, let's jump off this and we'll have a good, we'll have a good little chat. Say no more. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get, let's, let's, let's do Takea mode off. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a good hour and a half interview, so yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, and I, I definitely got to go. So, but it's been nice talking to you, brothers, man. Yeah, my really hope to do nice it again. Meet, yeah, nice to meet you too. My All right, Zian, thank you for setting this up, man. Uh, you really did a no good worries, job man. with this. Thank you. Appreciate it. My brother. Assalamualaikum. All right, well, alaikum salam.